Good morning, everybody. Welcome to SciVerse's Focus Forum webinar on managing, sharing, and publishing data with the data store. Um, today's webinar will last approximately one hour and include time for questions and answers. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, type your questions into the chat and I will make sure that Ramona will respond to them at the end. Um, by early next week, we will post materials from this webinar on the wiki page, which I've provided uh, the link to in the chat window. Um, we'll also send you a post webinar survey. Apologies in advance, but these really do help us uh, improve the webinar, so we'd appreciate your feedback. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ramona Walls. She's a Cyverse scientific informatician, and uh, she will start the webinar. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Tina. Um, I'd also like to point out that uh, Tony Edgen is here with me and he is he is our um, master and overseer of the data store <laughs> so, so if there are questions that I can't answer it Tony can answer them well we also got a few other experts online who might be able to chime in with answers so um, today's today's uh, presentation is going to and, and demo is going to be a fairly high level view of the data store it's going to give you an overview of different ways that one can access data you and you access data in cybers and use the data store we're going to dive into some um, more detailed topics in a future webinar so today we'll cover um, I'll, I'll give you a quick introduction to what the data store is we'll talk about uploading and downloading data all the different ways that you can do that I'll give you a few tips on on uh, managing data and publishing data and then like I said in a future focus forum we'll talk focus on some advanced topics like using um, a, the Agave API to access the data store IRODS Federation and content delivery so the data store is really the heart of everything that Cybers does. If you look at this very uh, um, graphical representation of our infrastructure, you can see that all of our other services and platforms are connected to the data store. And that's because data is really at the heart of what scientists come to Cybers to do, which is to analyze and manage their data. Currently, there are about two and a half petabytes of data on the Cybers data store. Um, that's about 90 million files, and it's growing at a rate of about 600 gigabytes per day. So that means there's a lot of data. In order to manage that huge volume of data, we're using a service, a, a system called IRODS. That's the Integrated Rule Oriented Data System. And um, IRODS was not built by Cyverse. It's built, um, it's built out of uh, RENSI, the Rens um, Renaissance Computing Institute. Um, but it's an open source platform that we are leveraging within Cyverse to manage our user data. So I'm going to start by talking about the really basic thing you need to do to be able to use cybers, which is getting your data in and out of the data store. Uh, we have a number of different methods for doing it. This is not all of them, but these are the most commonly used ones. The discovery environment, which is our web interface. CyberDuck, which is a, a, um, a desktop client. iCommands is a command line tool for accessing the data store. Atmosphere are virtual machines, and once you're in Atmosphere, of course, you need to be able to move your data in and out to, to do analyses. And then lastly, I'll mention Fuse, which is a cloud-based um, uh, file system. So the discovery environment, these, so throughout this presentation, I've got a lot of links. And um, we will be posting the presentation on the wiki page online so that you can have access to all of these links. So most of what I'm covering is fairly straightforward and very well documented in our user, various user manuals that are available on our wiki. So for example, you can go to the um, to the wiki page on managing data files and folders in, as part of the DE manual. And that will, will um, explain in more detail all of the content that I'm gonna go over rather quickly today. So the, um, the most basic way of getting data into the DE is using simple uploads. You can do up to five files at once. Each file must be less than 1.9 gigabytes because the DE is a is a web interface. It doesn't work well for uploading very large files. Um, for larger files, if those files are located on another, another site that has a URL, for example, an FTP site, you can use import from URL. You can actually use the import from URL to upload from password protected sites um, in, by including your na username and password in the in the URL, though um, for security reasons, we can't recommend that you do that. So uh, just be careful before you decide to decide to, um, to take that option. So let me um, just quickly go to, to a browser here and show you some of this in the discovery environment. So if I'm in my home folder, then I've got a directory here I've browsed to, then it's very simple. I just do upload, simple upload from desktop, 
and then as I said, you can do up to five files. You browse. This is this is very intuitive. I think it browses. It goes you to wherever you want, and you can choose up to five files to upload at one time. Um, downloading is is similar. So again, if I if I've, I'll browse to you can't can't you cannot download entire directories at one time from within the DE. I'll show you a way to do that later, but you can download individual files. So simply click on the download me um, menu and choose simple download. Notice for both upload and download, if you choose the bulk download option, it's going to tell you, go use another method. Essentially, these instructions will tell you to go use another method. And the other methods that they're gonna tell, that it tells you to use are CyberDuck and iCommands. And, and that's what I'm gonna demo in just one minute. So let me make this a little bit bigger here for future reference. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation. CyberDuck is so, so if you need to, um, if you need to move uh, entire folders, if you want to, if you're doing a lot of upload and downloading and you'd like a simple graphical tool that you can use on your desktop that lets you drag and drop files from your local hard drive onto the Cyber's data store, then Cyber, CyberDuck is a very um, convenient tool to use. It wasn't developed, like iRods, it wasn't developed directly by Cyber's um, but it was developed to work with the IROTS data system so, so that Cyber's users are able to use it. Um, if you haven't used CyberDuck before, the first thing you need to do is go and get download it and, and, um, uh, and install it. And so we have here a link to the um, wiki page. Actually, I'm sorry, this is, well, the link will still work. Um, it will give you instructions on how to do that. Um, there's a configuration file that you need to set up. So let me just show you here. Oh, that's interesting. So here's the, um, here are the instructions. You will download this, this there's, um, you download the configuration file here for your desktop. I've already done that, so let me get out of this. Let's see. Interesting. Okay, so let me go to my desktop. Well, I don't need to, I, so you can see, so I've go to, I've downloaded, the, I've downloaded the configuration file. This is what you're doing. And so when you get ready to install, you basically just need to, you have that preloaded configuration file that's, that you, works with Cyverse. And it should open up. So it's open CyberDuck for me. And you can see it's already set up with many of, you don't need to change the defaults here. All you need to supply is your username. Um, and everything else is ready to go. So when you do this, make sure that you've selected this open multiple connections um, or else, um, or else your, your download speeds can be slowed down. So you go ahead and you set this up and it basically will create this little profile for you here. So you can say I've already done this before so I actually have two of these connections set up. But when I click on one, it asks for my password. This is just your uh, normal Cyverse username and password. Oh, I probably typed the password wrong. Let me try this again. Okay, that time I like my password better. And so you can see it's opened up here on my desktop an exact copy of what I've got going in the data in the in in the data store. So if we go back here to, if you look on um, on my on in the discovery environment, you can see that all the different directories that I've got in my home folder, they're showing up exactly here on my on my desktop, and I can use them. So if I want to upload, it's simple to to do uploads and downloads. Um, we've got an upload button. If I've selected a file, I can select a directory and go. Download, I could download this folder. I can set up where you want it to download to. I can, I can just drag this file from here onto my desktop to copy it, to download a file that way. Very simple to use. Another nice feature of CyberDuck is if you need to do a lot of moving of files between, um, between different systems, for example, if you're working with an FTP uh, storage system and you need to move a bunch of files onto Cybers, you can, you can open two windows at once. Oops, sorry. Let's 
So you can see I've already made a, I've already set up a connection to the Grammy and FTP server. So I can double click on that, which is an anonymous server. I don't need to log in for that. So I can, I can double click on that. And if I wanted to, I could, um, I can take a file from here and just drag it over to my, to my Cybers window and copy data that way. So it's a really convenient data. I'm not gonna actually go ahead and do that, but it's a really convenient way to move data around. So um, the other thing I'd like to be able to show you on, on, on using CyberDuck is how to access public data in Cybers. So if you're familiar with Cybers, if you've been using the data store, whoop, sorry, I get out of the presentation again. So if you're familiar with using Cybers, um, you may realize that all of our public data is under this share in the DE, it shows up under the shared with me directory. And so we have a number of public files that are um, in the data commons. I'll mention that later. So we have this um, directory called, not share, sorry, not under share with me, under community data. So we have a directory here called commons repo. And so this is some public data. So suppose that I want to access something from this commons repo, or maybe I want to access this data that's under um, the Legume Federation. So I, I go to, you can see here that this is the, the file path to the Legume Federation data. And since this is public, I don't actually need to be logged in to see that. So let me get um, CyberDuck open again. Oh, I'm going to drag it back to this window just a second. So I'm going to open a new connection. No, I've got to go over to the other. Sorry, it's tricky using um, two, two desktops when you're not used to it. OK, so I get this window open, and I want to make a new connection to the anonymous data. Um, so I, could, I can hit plus down here. And it will allow me to create a new connection. You can say I've already done one here, but I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and make a new one, make another one. Okay, so this I could use the same way as before, but instead of putting in my username or password, I'm going to click anonymous download. And then I'm going to put in the path that I want to go to. So that was iPlan home shared. And so this is where all of our public data is located. So if I just use this path. I can go ahead and, and I can name this, I can name this public, so we'll call it cyber, cybers public. Okay, now I open up this connection. Takes a minute. Something's happening. Uh, okay. Oh, th thank you, Tony. <laughs> it's good to have someone looking over me. Share it. You're absolutely right. Yep, it should be shared. Thanks. Okay. Still sometimes takes a minute to open up. Well, suffice it to say that when it, if it were opening properly in this window, which it will eventually, instead of opening up and displaying, displaying see here, it's, it's just kind of slow this morning on this computer. Okay. There we go. So now, instead of seeing all of my, the files that are in my home directory, I'm seeing all of the folders that are on, under iPlan Home Shared. You can do the same thing to open, to, to um, look at data that's been shared with you by another user. Instead of entering iPlan Home Shared, you would enter iPlan Homed and then the user's name. So for example, if I want to look at data that's been shared with me by Tony, I would put iPlan Home I plan home slash Tony. And then it wouldn't show me all of Tony's home directory. What it would show me is only the data that's been, um, only the data that Tony has, has, has shared with me so far. Okay, so let me go back to my presentation here.
an important tip when you're setting up connections. So within, don't, don't ever try to open a connection to iPlant Home or just to iPlant directly and then browse to shared um, because there are many, many folders in all of, in both of those, particularly in iPlant Home. And there's one folder for every user, you know, so it's got what, 25, 30,000 different folders in it. So if you try to open a connection to that directory, um, it will time out and not work. So just make sure that you specify after I plant home that you specify a specific um, directory that you want to go to, either a username, your own name, or shared. Okay, let's move on to um, the next method, which is using I command. So I commands is a command line tool for accessing the data store. Here are some helpful links on how to set up I commands and how to use it. Um, the bottom link is particularly user, you, helpful if you end up using I commands. On our on this link um, of using I commands, there are a number of helpful, like most commonly used commands. But the full help pages for all of those commands are here listed at this at this final link. So some of the most common commands that you'll want to use are um, logging in. So you use I init. So once you've installed I commands on your computer, you use I init to, initial, to initiate a new session. It will ask you for your cyber's username and password. Um, to change directories, you use ICD. To upload a file from your local computer onto the data store, you use I put. To download a file, um, you use I get. So if you're, if you're a command line Unix user, this is probably starting to look familiar to you. Basically, just put I in front of all the commands that you would normally use. You can use ILS, IPWD, et cetera. Um, sharing is ICHmod. And then rather than giving a special I commands demo right now, what I'm going to do is use I commands to do some of the tasks that I have to do later in the demonstration. So you'll see some of these tasks actually in action. So the, the next way that I want to talk about using the uh, accessing the data store is through Atmosphere. So Atmosphere is our cloud computing platform. It lets you set up virtual machines to do essentially whatever you want. Once you've got your VM, your instance started though, you need to get data onto it. Um, and you, the, um, one of the easiest ways to do that is just to use I commands. If you're, whether you're using a, an image with a, that's got a graphical user interface, a GUI, or you've got a command line image. Um, I, I commands will work with either of those. Another way that's very useful and easy is to mount a volume. A volume is a virtual hard drive that you attach to one or more of your instances. Um, and uh, we also have a new tool called Kanki. So CyberDuck, because CyberDuck does not work with Linux operating systems, it's not, you can't just install it on, on a VM that has a GUI. Um, there's this new tool called Kanki, however. Um, it's so new that I just learned about it about 15 minutes ago. So I can't give you a dem demo on it, but if you have questions, please feel free to ask those at the end. And we've got people who can answer those questions. Um, I'm not going to demonstrate how to attach volumes because the iRods, um, sorry, the uh, the atmosphere, um, the atmosphere uh, user manual has very clear, um, very clear documentation on how to do that. Available at this link. Um, so essentially, though, you start a if you're if you're familiar with atmosphere, then you know that you you create projects for doing any of your work. So you create a project. You create a volume within that project. You click on the volume and you attach it to one of the instances within the pro volume. And then once you're then once you're in in that instance working, you can write directly to that to that um, to that volume. It's very handy. Um, it's important that you save that if you're generating data on your atmosphere instance that you save it to the volume and not to just some random directory on your on your instance, or it won't get saved into the volume. And then a of course, you have to back up that volume and detach it. You need to send the data back to the data store because the volume is actually operating within your instance, not as directly part of the data store. Um, so it's very important that you back up your data. Um, on, on, the, on the wiki, there are very nice steps on how to, how to back up uh, a volume. There's a simple command called, I think it's called just backup, that you type to, to do that. Um, you can then restore the, the data to to that same instance or to some other instance. Oh. Sorry. So if you really, if you really wanted to have your um, your data store directory displayed and available within your VM, there's a tool called Fuse, the file system user in user space. Um, here's the link to the wiki page with documentation on that. That mounts a direct copy of your data store directory into a local directory. Uh, the problem is that it's very slow and clunky, um, and it has some other uh, usability issues. And so we have found here that for almost all use cases, 
another method is better. Um, you're really better off using I commands. Um, there is a mounted version of CyberDuck called Mountain Duck, which works, may work a little bit better than the straight Fuse client. Um, there are a number of different clients for using Fuse. Um, you have to pay for Mountain Duck. And again, I don't know that that works within, and I think again, that's, that may be a, a restricted to not working on Linux operating systems. So it may not work directly within Atmosphere images, with, yeah, within Atmosphere. So I guess what I, in short, the, the point of this slide is not to say, here's this thing, don't use it, is to say that if you have a situation with data that you need to, um, that none of the solutions that I just showed you are working for, please contact us and we can work with you to help you figure out which of those, either which of those systems is better um, or to, to maybe find, find another solution that's out there. So one last way of getting data um, in out, you can't put data into the data store, but you can get data out of the data store is through the data commons. So the data commons is for only public data. Um, it's a special directory within the Cyverse. And so this is, it's datacommons.cyverse.org, also dc.cyverse.org. So if you um, want to get data out of there, you can browse their data. So you can browse community release data or Cyverse curated data. I'll talk a little bit later about what those two different types of data are. So let's browse to some data here and I can show you what I mean. So here's a data set. And suppose I want to download this readme file. Let's go to the page for it. All I have to do is click on download. It's really simple. Um, so if the file is less than two gigabytes, so this is downloading over HTTP. So if it's a large file, you can't download it directly. Direct, direct, uh, sorry, directly. Rather, there will be instead of saying download, there will be a link telling, directing you to the wiki pages to tell you how to use CyberDoc or I commands or etc. to to download um, the larger files. Uh, another nice thing is that if you, if suppose you're using the Data Commons website to, to find some data and then you want to be able to download or you want to be able to use it in another application that needs to call that data directly, the nice thing is that even for those very large files, um, rather than having to go to the web page and click on download, you can download directly from a URL um, by cha slightly changing the URL that's in the web page. So if you notice one of those data sets, We'll have a URL of the form datacommons.cybers.org slash browse, and then the path to where the file is. If you simply substitute download for the word browse, it will take you directly to the location of the file, and then you can read it indirectly. So that's very nice for using tools that like, uh, like in, in, this, in Cybers, for example, to import from a URL, uh, which I forgot to show you. I'll go back to that for one second. So. Um, the other option is if you were to say use this link right here, it would in fact redirect you, redirect you to the to the DE's data service, and it will it will take you to this URL. So you can actually substitute this whole first part of the URL, the Data Commons part, with https slash anon file, and then this will take you direct. This will this will take you to the same place as that. And so, um, actually, since I since I forgot to demo that, I'm going to go back to the to the DE for a second, and show about importing from URL. So let me actually just suppose I want to import this file right here into my into my own data directory. Now I don't need to import this file into my data directory because like it's a public file. I can work with it. I can use it as an input to an analysis in the DE directly from that URL because anybody can access this. But but. Suppose for some reason I really want to have my own copy of it and then I want to do some stuff with it. So I can do um, upload, import from URL, type the URL in there, and hit import. And um, it sends a job off to the data store, so it might take, it might take a minute for this to happen, but it will um, at some point. It's not done yet. So when it finishes the download to the import, it will show up here as part of this directory. Okay. All of these, all of these things that I'm showing you are documented in the in the wiki and available. There are links to all these all these um, activities in the in the presentation. Okay. So now I'm going to do one more. Um, 
show you one more trick for working with data in the data store, um, the special topic of connecting data to a genome browser. So um, often there are, there are genome files that people are working with that they have in the, in the, in the, the Cybers data store, um, and they might want to send them out to look at them somewhere. We don't have genome browsers built in directly to the DE, but we do have links out to a number of different browsers including Ensemble, UCSC, IGV, et cetera, all of these listed here. And so you can send out a link for any of these genome file types, BAM, BCF, et cetera, won't read the whole list. Um, it's important to remember that the BAM and BCF files have to have a matching index file in order for them to be readable. Um, and that the, for the other file types, um, the, the name of the reference genome's FASTA header has to match the G name in the genome file. Otherwise, they just won't work within the G name browser. Um, the files have to be tagged with the correct info type, and, um, the, for fast, and if it's a FASTA file, you can also view it within Koji, um, which is a specialized type of genome browser. Um, finally, tip, if you have an issue, if you're not able to open your file in the genome browser, you may need to change the, the links that are generated by the DE automatically or HTTPS. You may need to change that to HTTP to get them to work. So this is where I'm going to exit the presentation and show you a little demo um, of how to use I commands to carry out some of these steps. So suppose um, there, I have a genome file. So there are some, there are some um, examples available here. And suppose there's one in the public data in Cyverse that I would like to be able to browse in, in a, to create a link to. So um, if I look under this, the community data, so I have iPlant, I plant test. Sorry, I plant public test. And then um, by range, there's just some example genome stored here. So suppose that I want to be able to look at this uh, genome right here in a browser. I'm going to select it. Um, and then I can send it directly to the genome browser from here. But suppose again that I wanted to copy this into my own directory, do some work with it, and send it to the genome browser from that from here. So um, the, the discovery environment does not support the copy feature. You would have to download it from here and then upload it back into your own working directory to work with it. Um, that's a bit tedious. There's an easier way to do that using I commands. So. So I'm here now. I've got my. So now I'm going to show you using I commands. I am on my um, terminal. I need to log in. So I do an I init. And now I can see where am I in where am I? I do IPWD. I happen to be in Amanda Cooksey's directory because I was looking at one of her files. I'd rather be in my own directory. Actually, what I'd like to do is to go to the directory where that public data file is and look at that data. And look at that data. So I'm going to do ICD, iPlant, home, shared. iPlant public test. And then by range. I actually could have just copied this from the from right here within the DE. That would have probably been easier. Ramona, there's a typo in your. In your Thank list. you. I see it. This is why copying it would have been better. Okay, so now I do IPWD and you can see that, that I'm in that directory and I can do ILS and it should show me the files that are there. It's showing me the same things that I see in the DE window. Okay, so now what I'd like to be able to do is copy that file. I want to copy this BAM file. In order to view it in the genome browser, I need, remember, I need both the BAM file and the BAM.BAI file, the index file. I've already copied the index file um, because it's large and I didn't want to do that. Um, I'm sorry, I've already copied, well, actually the, the BAM file is bigger, but it goes pretty fast, so I'm going to do that anyway. So I can do ICP. And then I, I need this file name. So here, I need this file. And I want to copy it to
to a folder that I've got in my home directory. And it might take, oh, uh, I, oh, so I've already copied, I already copied it earlier when I was practicing that. So if I hadn't copied it, or so, so you can see that since the file is already in there, it's giving me an alert that, does, that it can't overwrite it. I could put in a force flag in ICP to force it to overwrite. I'm not going to bother to do that right now because it's already there. So we can go to my home directory and see. By the way, you see that README file that I did import from URL earlier has shown up there now. So here's the file that I used in ICP to copy earlier. It's in my home directory. So when I click on it, again, I want to send it to, I want to send it to, you know, first I need to make sure that the info type is an acceptable type for, for browsing. BAM is okay, but if this were not set or it were set to something else, I could browse this list and reset the info type. I'm going to leave it on BAM because that's what it is. And once it's registered that it's the proper type, this automatically shows up the send to genome browser link. So what happens is it generates this link and I can copy this link and then go to one of these genome browsers and view it there. Um, I'm not going to do that right now in the interest of time. So, uh, but this is, a, this is a nice feature that's available. So you can see how we can use iPlant for I commands for moving data around. We can use the DE to look at those same data files. And that's the nice thing about having this data store in the back end is that no matter which of our platforms you're interacting with, you're looking at the same set of data and you can do the same sets of similar sets of operations. Okay, back to the, back to the, um, sorry, to the presentation for a moment. Doing okay for time. Common problems with data transfer. So um, things didn't actually work perfectly even when I was doing this, but they worked pretty well because I was I did practice a little bit. But you know, in real life, often people run into problems and things don't work that smoothly. So one of the most common problems we have is that people have installed CyberDuck or iCommands and they can't get it to work. Um, that is usually due to a firewall installed at a local university that blocks access to the port that's required for I commands. Um, and Tony, do you remember like what they have to do to it's setting up the, do you want to say? Oh. <laughs> so it's, it's like changing it to port uh, 1657 or, or uh, no, they have to allow uh, the, the local the institution's firewall needs to allow your uh, computer to connect to port 1247 um, at uh, well, our IP address. Right. So. so, so essentially, it's it's something that has to be changed by your university's IT department. And we've worked with a number of universities. Most most uh, universities are amenable to doing that. They're willing to do it. It's just not a standard um, a, a standard setup for them. So, if you run into this problem, please contact support. We can send you the information to send to to give to your university's IT department to allow this to work. Um, Another problem we run into is um, when people are trying to upload thousands of files at one time using iCommands. So iCommand, iCommands does work quite well for very large files, um, you know, up to um, 20, 40 gigabytes. It's usually not a problem, especially if you're using a decent internet connection. Um, it can work fine for a thousand files. If you've got 10,000 files, chances are that you're going to run into problems because each file set, bear in mind that each upload is a job that's running on our IROD system and that takes a certain amount of time. And so doing, submitting 10,000 jobs at one time, not surprisingly, is going to cause um, some problems for the system. So if you do have many thousands of files, a couple of things you can do is one, break them up into smaller batches of a thousand. Two, bundle them up into tar files before you upload them. Rather than uploading a thousand small files, create one tar bundle that's got all, that's, that's one file that you can upload. Then you use the normal iPut to upload it. Then once it's in the data store, you can use ibun command to extract that, that, that tar file from within the data store. Likewise, if you need to move things around within the data store from one directory to another, rather than doing imove dash r for a recursive move to move a thousand files, use ibun to create a bundle. Um, within the data store, move it, and then unbundle it. That will, that will give you much better results. Um, 
Sometimes we get timeouts with very large files. Um, often that's a network error. Um, Tony, can you think of other common causes for that happening? For timeouts? Yeah. No, nah. it's, it's always network error. It's always network error. Okay, there you go. You know, so again, if you're trying to move files that are um, terabytes in size, maybe contact us and, and we'll work with you on ways to do that. Um, there are some other random, well, another, another common problem is that names, um, names are not Unix friendly. So you should probably get in the habit of naming your files without spaces or special characters. So Tony and I recently have been going through a list of file extensions in the data, in the data store. And we have, there are file names with tabs, there are file names with commas, multiple commas, there are file names with carriage returns in them. And, and these are presumably generated by automatic processes in which people are running a script that generates a file and stores it. Um, but when you write your scripts, try to make sure that they're not creating these crazy, um, crazy file names. It will, it will make everybody's life easier and happier. Okay, so that's working with data, getting data in and out. Um, I'm going to switch topics here a little bit and talk about publishing data. So um, the Cyvers um, has a part of Cyvers is something we call the data commons. That the data commons is essentially Cyvers's effort to support um, fair and open data throughout the entire data lifecycle. And as part of that, the data commons offers various mechanisms for our users to publish their data. Um, so first I'll talk about what it means to make your data fair, if you're not familiar with that term. Then um, I'll give you a quick overview about how to publish your sequence data to NCBI, how to request a DOI, and how to create a community release data folder. Oh, first, this is just to show you that, yes, we have all kinds of data in Cybers. Um, the range from single files that are owned by a single user that are completely private, nobody else ever sees, to data that is public, that has many different users, and everything in between. We support all of these different data types. Oh, my figure, my picture isn't showing up. There we go. FAIR data. So FAIR is a buzzword that if you've been to a conference in the past year, you've probably heard 20 times. Um, there's a principle, there are, there are citations I should put, I'll add the reference to this, to the, to this um, slide before we post it. So making your data FAIR has to do with making it findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, if you're getting funding, then usually your funding asks you, how will you make your data available to the public? Um, it's not enough to just necessarily put your data somewhere and then say, it's there, anybody can find it. Um, you have to actually do some, make some effort to make sure that people can find your data and that they can access it, they can reuse it. Um, the key to that is using good metadata to describe your data accurately so people can describe it and so that they can really understand how your data was generated. Um, when you're adding metadata, it's important to follow the relevant data and metadata standards for your different data types. And we have some support tools within Cybers to promote those standards. For example, if you're submitting to the NCBI, then you have to describe your data using the uh, minimum information for any sequence and standards. And we make those available through a template. Um, it's also important to use open source formats. So for example, if you have a choice, if you're publishing a, publishing a spreadsheet, publish it as a text or a CSV file rather than as an Excel file so that it will be available to more users for a longer time. Um, making data accessible also means making it available via web services, um, preferably directly from a URL. So many repositories of data, um, when you go to say, when you go to the landing page for a data set, you can't actually get directly to the data. You usually have to use use um, one of their special web services to get the data, which is great. Um, but something that Cybers does that makes it even easier, as I showed earlier, is that you can actually type in the URL to get directly to the data. And that makes it reusable by um, external applications directly. And to repeat the first point, good metadata is key. So use metadata. Um, one of the most common, common publishing methods through Cybers and, and something that almost all users, uh, scientists who are working with sequence data are familiar with is publishing their data and CBI. Why is this? Because in order to publish your paper in a journal, the sequences that are in it have to be available through NCBI. Um, there are diff various repositories at NCBI, that's the National Center for Biotechnology Information. Um, one of the most commonly used ones is the SRA or Sequence Read Archive, and this is for raw sequences generated by next generation sequencing data. So these are your FASTQ files, essentially. Um, 
there is a link to the tutorial on how to, to use that, uh, to, to use the workflow for submitting to SRA. We have a new workflow for submitting to the whole genome shotgun archive. Um, right now that workflow only works with incomplete assemblies. There are links there if you have a completed assembly on how to submit that. So we've been told by users that um, these packages are these, these, two, these workflows are, uh, are much easier than actually going to SRA to the NCBI site and trying to submit directly. It's not that the NCBI site is so hard, it's just that if you don't do it on a regular basis, there's a learning curve every time you wanna do it. Where, whereas with the um, Cybers tools, we've got really nice tutorials that just walk you through it step by step and make this submission relatively easier, easy. So again, if you're interested in, in publishing, please visit one of those tutorials to get more information. So I should point out that, um, well, I'll, go to, I'll show you that one second. Um, the other, another, another data, another way of publishing data is to request a DOI, a digital object identifier. So a DOI is, um, is a permanent identifier that points to a landing page for your data, that, that landing page describes your data, and it can be used to cite your data. If you've, if you've looked at papers, you're probably familiar with DOIs because mo almost all scientific papers have a DOI that describes, describes that paper. Uh, we at Cybers can issue DOIs for data sets, uh, but we don't just do them for any type of data. Um, it's, it's essentially for data sets that don't have a home in another repository. So if there already exists in a repository for your data type, we strongly encourage you to submit there and not to submit to Cybers. We also encourage um, users to request DOIs for data types that can be reused within the Cybers infrastructure. So the whole point of making them available for, through, through Cybers is to make them more reusable. So a DOI data set is something that is stable, that is basically it's a data set that you're finished with, that you're not going to change more. It's permanent in that um, it will be around for a long time. Nobody can guarantee that data will be available forever, um, but we can guarantee that at least the landing page to the description of the data will be available, and that might point you to another archive where you have to go and get the data. Um, Data that has a DOI um, in Cybers, and I have this little word here, ARC. An ARC is an archival research key. It's another kind of permanent identifier. Um, these data are managed and curated by the Cybers staff. So once you've submitted your data for a DOI, even though you maintain the intellectual ownership of that data, you cannot edit it or change it in any way. If you need to make changes to it, um, because it's got a permanent identifier, we need to issue a version and make a new ID for it. Um, we require that DOI data sets be described using the data site metadata standards, and we also strongly encourage scientists to use scientific metadata. And part of that curation process is us looking at the data set and saying, uh, no, you need to describe this a little bit better, or yeah, could you please explain what this means or maybe work this way so that other users can, can understand that data. The other way of publishing data through Cybers is through community released folders. So community released folders don't have DOIs, and unlike um, unlike the uh, Cybers curated data, the managed the owners of the data are there actively managing those data folders themselves. So that means that. Um, Although these, these communities have chosen to make their data publicly available, it's not necessarily permanent and it's not necessarily stable. The data sets can be changing. They might be updating them. Um, and the reason for this is that there are often people are creating data sets and they want to make it, put it out there as soon as possible so that people can, can use it. Um, but they know that they're still working or going to be working on it continuously and definitely. And so they don't want to necessarily issue a DOI where it's like, it can't ever change. And so this is another way for users to, to for the community to share their data. Um, these data also have some metadata standards. They're slightly more, slightly simpler. We use the Dublin Core metadata standard here, and we strongly encourage those, the communities that are supplying this data to, um, to make scientific metadata and descriptions available as well. So any of these data types, publication meshes that I just talked about. So you can see here, if you want to see the data that's already available through community lead released or Cybers curated, it's easily available through the data commons. If you have questions about how to publish data, here's links on instructions to the SRA, on instructions to publishing to the WGS, and on instructions on publishing to Cybers. So this will explain to you, this page will take you, this will take you to a page that explains how to request a DOI or, or how to request a community release data folder. Okay. Then last, I'm just gonna wrap up with a few quick data management tips. Um, 
there are a number of tools that you can use within cyber's infrastructure for managing your data. Um, sharing data is, is one that's very helpful. Um, organ you can use cyber the data, data store to organize your data. And of course, you can use metadata, as I mentioned, maybe once or twice already. So sharing data can be done directly through the, um, through the discovery environment. You can also create public links. You can grant, grant read, write, or ownership permit permission. And you can also use I commands to share. So I'll do a quick demo here of that, show you this in the, um, in the DE, show you some, so how to share. It's pretty straightforward. So I've got some files that I own here. I just click on this little, uh, the two, the picture with people. So that's indicating sharing. I can also go under share. There's two different ways to get to this. And um, I want to um, share it with uh, Tony. Let's see if we can find his name. Okay, so but the, but I guess what I'd actually like to demonstrate is that you don't have to know the use the user's name. You just have to know their. I mean, you don't have to know their username. You you can just search by their name and um, their institution. So and that will help you find them. So Tony right now has read permission. I can actually make him give him write permission so that he could um, he could. Um, rename, if I give him, say I give him ownership permission, that means he could actually delete this file and rename it. So be careful who you give ownership permission to. Um, you don't want to just, you know, generally it's good to give users the, uh, the most restrictive permission that still lets them do what you want to be able to do. So you can do the same thing. There's a command in I commands called ICH mod. You basically use ICH mod and then, um, the uh, then you then you either read write or own and then the user's name and then the name of the file or collection that you want to share them with that's documented in the i commands i won't just demo that in the interest of time okay Oop. in terms of organizing your data we've got some tips on the wiki so here's a link to the um to uh, a, a wiki page that shows you, that gives you some tips on how to organize your data for a shared project. It also talks about if you so a common thing that people use Cybers for is to have, is to manage the data for a project that has many collaborators in many different as institutions. The nice thing about the data stores with these sharing permissions, you don't all have to be on the same university system. Um, you, can, you can be scattered literally throughout the world and have all the team members access your data. Um, so this describes a little bit about how to set that up. Coming very soon, within the next month or so, we expect them to be able to create teams, and teams will basically let you set up lists of collaborators that you share things with on a regular basis. Um, you can also use the iPlant metadata function to search for metadata, and then you can save your search. And even though it's not really the same thing as a smart folder that you might use on your desktop, if you save your search, then you can go back and run that same search and, and basically use metadata to find the same types of data consistently over and over again. So that's another reason why metadata can let you, um, if you, if you rely on naming your folders and files to organize, and the organization of your folders and files to organize your data, that's great. But then you're stuck with that one set of organizations. Whereas if you use metadata, you can, you can organize them the way that you need based on the different combination of metadata values. Um, there's a very nice link. So there's a project called Data One, um, and they have a really nice set of resources for managing and organizing data. So I've put a link into their best practices website there, and I suggest that you take a look at that. Um, anyone who's written the NSF uh, proposal or NIH proposal recently knows that you have to include a data management plan. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the numbers are in the NIH, but in NSF, uh, points four, five, and six particularly ask you how will you deal with data dissemination, what are your policies for data sharing, public access, and reuse, and your plans for archiving data samples, software, etc. So Cybers is a tool that can be used to answer many of these questions, and we'll be getting some documentation up on the Data Commons wiki site um, with some suggestions and sample data, data management plans for people to use that, though I'm, I'm afraid we don't have that there yet to link to. So using metadata in the DE, in the interest of time, I'm not going to demonstrate the use of metadata. I would just say that there are many things that you can do with metadata in the data store. Um, this is a, the link will take you there to a, a wiki page that explains how to do everything. You can add and edit metadata. You can apply metadata using a template. Um, if you want to publish to any of the to to the Data Commons 
report to NCBI, you'll need to be able to use templates. You can copy metadata from one object to another. Um, so if you've created a file and then you say, ah, I need the same metadata over here, but maybe with one change, you copy it and then you make a small change. And you can also apply metadata in bulk. You basically um, upload a CSV file with all of your metadata, one row per file, and then, the, then, then there's a tool that reads that metadata and applies it to many files simultaneously. And with that, I'm going to stop and leave time for questions. So I'll need to go to the chat. I'll need to escape out of here in order to see the chat, I think. Ramona, there's one question. OK. Um, it's from Gaurav. And it's more, I think, of a suggestion rather than a technical question. Okay. He asked, um, will we discuss the hosting of web apps on Cyverse to share results from publications using Cyverse slash exceed resources. I think that was maybe beyond your... Um, <laughs> it's a little beyond the scope of this, but I think I, I, can, I can answer that. We don't, we don't necessarily host web apps, I mean, on Cyverse, because um, that would mean setting up a server for every individual web app that's out there, which is not a particularly scalable way of doing things. However, what we do is we have for many ways for users to share their applications through Cyverse. Um, if the application um, is, uh, basically the, the, two, the two most straightforward ways are through Atmosphere and through the discovery environment. So on Atmosphere, you can just create an Atmosphere image, install your application there. If your app requires a web browser to run, you can set up the browser within Atmosphere and then users can, can see, your app, see your app there. And that allows, that's a simple way to host a web app. So rather than setting up a unique server for, every, uh, for, for, each, for each web app, um, a person just spins up an Atmosphere instance and can open and run the application that way. If your application requires, um, a little more powerful compute, it's often better to run it direct to run it through the discovery environment. Um, so we use containerization to install, install discovery environment apps as well. A person would essentially, a developer would essentially create a Docker container for their app. Um, we have lots of documentation on that on the on the wiki as well. So you basically create a Docker container and then we can install install that and make that available through the DE. And Gaurav, I'm happy to um, point you to some additional resources after the demo for that as well. Looks like we have a few more chats that I can't see. If you could I'll read the questions read from Tina. Sure. There's a question regarding WRT mounting volumes on Atmosphere VMs. Question is, if I have data on a volume, then attach it to an Atmosphere instance and generate new data onto that volume, will I lose that new data when I unmount the volume and delete the instance? You will if you don't back it up first. <laughs> so that's why it's really important to back up your volumes before you unmount them. Back up to where? And so Nero says no. Nero says no. You will not lose it. So, so actually, <laughs> if the volume is kept around, the data should persist. That's right. So, so the volume will be stored. So, what will happen if your volume is if your volume is inactive for several months? It will be delete. It will be deleted, but then it will be stored. So, so yes. Yeah, so you can always unmount the volume and then spin it up again later. I mean, sorry, reattach it to to an instance to get it that way. But I still would recommend backing up your data. And there's a simple, um, I, I think I've put a, a link in this presentation. If I haven't, I'll add it. So there's a, a simple command that you can use in Atmosphere to back up your volume that's, that writes your volume to the data store. And you can do that while you're working, kind of, kind of like saving regularly when you're on your desktop to make sure that your data is saved. Great. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Um, if so please type them in. Otherwise, while uh, we're, oh, there is one. Let's see. Oh, Chris writes, think of a volume as a USB flash drive. They're pretty reliable, but occasionally you accidentally leave it in your pocket and put your pants in the wash. <laughs> <laughs> yep, good advice, Chris. So that's why, again, just it's How good many to times have you done that, Chris? Okay. Um, while if there are, we're waiting for any more questions, I would like to announce that our next uh, Focus Forum webinar will be October 27th by Tyson Swetnam. And it's about leveraging Cyverse for large-scale spatial analysis. So please uh, bookmark that in your calendar, and we'll get you more information. Um, the link is on our website to register for that. So if you go to our website, you will be able to find that and register. Um, but in the meantime, I don't think I see any more questions. So any last words of advice, Ramona? Um, please. Um 
please use the resources available, all of the help resources available that I have linked in this document. Our wiki is not always the friendliest, but it does have a, a ton of information in it. Um, if you're on a wiki page or you can't find something on the wiki, please feel free to post a question in ask.iplantcollaborative, and that helps us, one, improve the wiki, and also, um, also, um, you know, we'll, we'll answer your, we'll, first we'll answer your question, but it will also help us to improve the wiki and the documentation for future users. Great. Okay. Well, everyone, thank you so much for attending this webinar. And again, the link that will uh, provide you with the materials from today's presentation is up at the top of the chat. And thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for joining.